Turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Genesis. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Bible, the book of Genesis is the easiest one to find because it's the first book in the Bible. So just start in the beginning and you'll find it. Uh, we're going to be looking at Genesis chapters 32 and 33 this morning. And before I read that, let's pray together. Our Father, we do pray that you would uh, speak to us as we just sang, that you would open our hearts and minds to hear from you, to hear you speaking in the scriptures. Uh, we long to hear your voice, and uh, we pray that, that we would do that this morning by the power of your Holy Spirit speaking with and through your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis chapter 32 and 33. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's camp. So he called the name of that place Machaniam. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them... Thus you shall say to my Lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants and female servants. I have sent to tell my Lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob saying, We came to your brother Esau and he is coming to meet you. And there are 400 men with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided, divided the people who were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two camps, thinking, if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff, I crossed this Jordan. And now I have become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. But you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So he stayed there that night, and from what he had with him, he took a present for his brother Esau, 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milking camels and their calves, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. These he handed over to his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, pass on ahead of me and put a space between drove and drove. He instructed the first, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, to whom do these belong? Where are you going and whose are these ahead of you? Then you shall say, they belong to your servant Jacob. They are a present sent to my Lord Esau. And moreover, he is behind us. And likewise, in, he, he likewise instructed the second and the third and all who followed the droves. You shall say the same thing to Esau when you find him. And you shall say, moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he thought, I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me, and afterward I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on ahead of him, and he himself stayed that night in the camp. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had, and Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. 
Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants, and he put the servants with their children in front. Then Leah with her children, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. He himself went on before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And when Esau lifted up his eyes and saw the women and children, he said, Who are these with you? Jacob said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the servants drew near, they and their children, and bowed down. Leah likewise and her children drew near and bowed down. And last, Joseph and Rachel drew near, and they bowed down. Esau said, What do you mean by all this company that I have met? Jacob answered, To find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob said, No, please. If I have found favor in your sight, then accept my present from my hand, for I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God, and you have accepted me. Please accept my blessing that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. Thus he urged him, and he took it. Then Esau said, Let us journey on our way, and I will go ahead of you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are frail and that the nursing flocks and herds are a care to me. If they are driven hard for one day, all the flocks will die. Let my Lord pass on ahead of his servant and I will lead on slowly at the pace of the livestock that are ahead of me and at the pace of the children until I come to my Lord in Seir. So Esau said, let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. But Jacob journeyed to Sukkot and built himself a house and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkot. And Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, on his way from Padan Aram, and he camped before the city. And from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, he bought for a hundred pieces of money the piece of land on which he had pitched his tent. There he erected an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. <clears throat> Some lessons take virtually a lifetime to learn. I think most of us have no idea what God is teaching us at any given time. Uh, when people ask the question, What is God teaching you right now? The answer is, as likely as not, I have no idea. But one of the things that God has been teaching me over the past 20 years or so is how to pray. You may think me particularly dumb for taking 20 years to learn how to pray, but it's true. Uh, 20 years to understand what prayer is, 20 years to understand how important prayer is, 20 years to actually commit to a life of prayer, 20 years to follow through on that commitment. 20 years makes me feel a little like Jacob. I, you know, I tend to be very suspicious of sermons that are uh, do what David did or learn the lesson that Peter learned. Uh, the real hero of the Bible is Jesus. That said, lots of characters in the Bible are are, are types of Jesus. That a type is someone who is from the same mold, a picture, a foreshadow. Isaac is a beloved son offered on an altar as a sacrifice. Jesus is the beloved son offered on the cross for the sins of the world. David was a king persecuted by Saul. Jesus is the greater king who suffered in our place. 
Jeremiah was a weeping prophet opposed by the political and religious leaders of his day. Jesus is the greater prophet, a man of sorrows, opposed by the world, rejected even by the Father for a moment at the cross. Daniel was thrown into a lion's den and given up for dead, but was raised out again. Jesus is nailed to a cross and given up for dead, but was raised on the third day. Again and again, the pattern of Jesus' work was lived out by God's people ahead of time. And theologians call them types, and Jesus is the antitype or the fulfillment. They are patterned after the original. But then we are called to take up our cross and follow Jesus. We are called to live in that same pattern, to be conformed to the image of Jesus, which includes being conformed to the pattern of Jesus' life. So the Christian life is a life of being conformed to the image of Jesus in both his character and his work, to take up your cross and follow Jesus. Because of that, what we see in Jacob as he learns to walk with God over a period of 20 plus years is both a preview of the life of our Savior and a pattern which we are now to live out as we follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And so we have uh, three points this morning from our text. Rest in God's promises, cling to God in weakness, and step out as a servant. First, rest in God's promises. Jacob's life, uh, as we've been following it for a number of weeks now, Jacob's life has been long and hard. He grew up in a home full of rivalry and division. His parents played favorites. As a twin, you can imagine he and his brother were always neck and neck, trying to one-up one another, vying for first place, especially for first place in their father's heart. Jacob was a trickster and manipulator. He took advantage of others for his own gain. He was not a man of prayer. He was a man of action. Eventually, Jacob had sinned against his brother so bad that through his trickery and deceit, his brother wanted to kill him. And so Jacob ran, ran to his relatives in Haran. He continued his life of of no prayer and all action, but his uncle Laban was himself a trickster. And Jacob had met his match. And in a moment, in moment after moment of dramatic irony, the trickster was tricked, and he ends up running again this time running from Laban. Unlike Esau, Laban pursues him, and it could have been his end. Well, that's one way of telling the Jacob story up to this point, but it's not the only way. You see, before Jacob was born, God told his mother, Rebekah, that her older son would serve her younger. Jacob was the child of promise. Later, Jacob received God's blessing, not just the one he stole by deception, But on his way to Haran, his father blessed him again, unequivocally passing on to him all the blessings of Abraham, his grandfather. And while on the run, God met him in a dream. He saw a stairway coming down from heaven and angels ascending and descending on that stairway. And God spoke with him and promised to be with him and bring him back home again. Then he tangles with Laban. But God is with him. And Jacob says at the end of his encounter with Laban in Genesis 31, 42, if the God of my father, the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac had not been on my side, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. But God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands and he acted. He protected Jacob and he provided for Jacob. And I think finally Jacob has come to the point where he realizes after 20 years of God watching over him, uh, he realizes that Zechariah 4, 6, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, that God's blessing doesn't come as God puts it elsewhere by the strength of our legs and the might of our arms, but by his power and presence. Which brings us to our text and the story this morning. In verse 1, it picks up right after Laban has gone on his way. God had protected Jacob once more. And then we read this in verses 1 and 2. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. 
So he called the name of that place Machanayim. This is a strange few sentences. <laughs> uh, the, the word for angel is the same for messengers in verse 3. And the name Machanayim means two camps, and Jacob will shortly divide his people into two camps. And so it's clearly connected with what is about to happen. Uh, the question is how and why. Uh, I think two things are clear. First, Jacob meeting the angels is, is reminiscent of his vision at Babel of angels ascending and descending the stairway to heaven. And so perhaps what we have here is a reminder from God to Jacob that he is with him. Wherever he goes, whatever happens, that he is with Jacob. It's a little like uh, when Elisha prays that God would open the eyes of his servant to see that the angelic army of God is greater than the army of the king of Syria. God is giving Jacob a glimpse of his power behind the scenes. But second, with the messengers of God echoed in the messengers of Jacob and the two angelic camps later echoed in the camps of Jacob, there seems to be some kind of an on earth as it is in heaven pattern going on here which we will soon see played out in an even more beautiful way. Now, verse 3, I think, is actually more amazing than verses 1 and 2. Remember when Jacob left Canaan, his brother wanted to kill him. Esau was justifiably angry with Jacob. Jacob had no reason at this point to believe that his brother's anger had simmered down. What is amazing is this. Jacob sends messengers to Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. Now, at this point, Esau was no longer living in Canaan. In fact, uh, Jacob was coming from the north into the promised land, and Edom is south of the promised land, which means Jacob does not have to go anywhere close to Esau to get home. But he sends a message to his brother anyway. And, and all I can fathom is that Jacob at this point, has been genuinely so changed by grace, by God's protective and providing presence, that he pursues reconciliation with his brother. Grace leads to reconciliation. Peace with God leads to the pursuit of peace with people made in God's image. Jacob's maturity over 20 years has brought him to the place where he wants to make things right. He's not perfect. We'll see that as we continue reading the story. But he wants to make things right with his brother. He instructs his his messengers to say as much in verses four and five they are to say to Esau thus says your servant Jacob we'll come back to that word servant in a bit he says to tell them that he has oxen donkeys servants and so on not because he's rubbing it in I think he's saying look I'm not looking for anything from you I haven't come back to continue to cheat and steal but he says he says in order that I, might, that I may find favor in your sight. That's interesting that the words eyes and face keep coming up in this story, and, and I wish I could point out every time, but this is the first, that I may find favor in your eyes. Now the messenger comes back from going to Esau, and he says this, we came to Esau, and he's on his way with 400 men. He's got an army, and he's coming your way. And Jacob is understandably stressed. He, he divided his, divides his people into two camps so that if Esau attacks the one, the other might still get away. And then Jacob does something we have never seen him do before. He prays. It's perhaps the longest prayer in Genesis, and it's, it's actually a great prayer. Jacob, through his trials and tribulations, has learned to pray. He begins, actually, with God's covenant. He says, O oh God of my father Abraham, O oh God of my father Isaac. He's saying, you are my covenant God. You made promises to them, and those promises have been passed down to me. God of Abraham and Isaac. And then he moves to God's command. He says, you, you told me to return to my country and my kindred that you might do me good. You told me to do this. Then he confesses his unworthiness. In verse 10, he says, I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. I don't deserve anything from you, God. I know that. And then he recounts God's blessings that are undeserved. For with only my staff, I crossed this Jordan. That is, I had nothing when I left. Now I have become two camps. Everything I have is from you. Everything I have is undeserved. And then he moves to his request. He says, please, 
Deliver me from the hand of my brother. He admits, honestly, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of what's going to happen here. I fear him. And I don't just fear him for me. I fear him for the women and the children, those most vulnerable in my midst. And finally, he lands on the promises of God in verse 12. He says, but you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. And this is the first point. Jacob has learned to rest in the promises of God. You said, I will surely do you good. And we can do the same. You know, some wonder if Jacob is actually resting in God's promises here, because after all, the next thing he does is set aside an extremely large present, 550 animals in all, and he sends them ahead and tells his servants to say to Esau, these belong to your servant Jacob, they are a present sent to my Lord Esau. Some think that Jacob is not trusting God at this point, but is seeking to bribe his brother, and perhaps... But I don't think so, and for a couple of reasons. The word used for present is the word for a sacrificial offering. This is a symbolic gesture of goodwill. He does, as he says in verse 20, want to appease him with this gesture. But I don't think that means he's not trusting God. To put it bluntly, prayer and planning are not antithetical. They're not opposed to one another. You can pray and trust God and still make plans to achieve certain ends. That's okay. They can go hand in hand. And I don't think this is Jacob the schemer. This is Jacob who trusts God's promises and wants to make things right with his brother. And he's willing to do whatever is necessary to make that happen. See, trusting God does not look like inaction. It looks like praying, obeying, and then trusting God for the results. But we must not just trust God for anything, right? I I don't trust God for a new Ferrari. Uh, I I don't trust God to win the lottery. Uh, To trust God is to take him at his word. Jacob recounts the promises of God. And you and I should do the same. Now, if you're wondering, well, what promises in the Bible are for me? That's a good question. You have to take each scripture promise on its own, but but a brief answer to that question is this. Think about it. Any, Any Old Testament promise given generally to the people of God is fulfilled and transformed in Christ. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1.20, all the promises of God find their yes in Christ. So we look, as we look at that promise through the lens of the New Testament and through the lens of Jesus, you should be okay. But that's important. The promise in Christ is for you. Don't just focus on the shadow. Focus on the fulfillment in Jesus. And of course, any New Testament promise given generally to the church, the body of Christ of which you are a part, are, are a part is for you. Now, we could discuss individual promises. You can come and talk to me and say, well, what about this or what about that? That'd be great. Let's talk about it. But the point is, we need to rest in God's promises for us in Christ. Second, cling to God in weakness. Our tendency, like Jacob's for most of his life, is to rely on ourselves. We trust our own effort. Our confidence is in our strength, our abilities, our virtues, our skills. Even insecurity can be a sign of self-reliance. And Jacob had spent the better part of his life relying on his tricks, his lies, his deception to make things happen. And finally, things were beginning to change in his life. I'm not, again, I'm not saying Jacob was perfect, but that, it, just wait, we'll see. But that's the way growth works in the Christian life, isn't it? It's long, it's slow, it's gradual, it's step by step, it's up and down and back and forth. And that night, as Jacob was anticipating Esau's arrival, he takes all of his cattle, all of his flocks, all of his, his people and his family, and he puts them on the other side of the Jabbok River, which leaves him alone in verse 24. It's a curious move, uh, and as far as I can tell, the only reason for Jacob to do this was spiritual. You know, uh, Jesus in the New Testament often went off by himself with his father to pray. Here, Jacob does the same thing. Perhaps he's trying to, to recreate his experience at Bethel when he was alone at night and God met with him. The, the story picks up at this point from Jacob's perspective. Verse 24 says, a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. A man. Where did this man come from? 
Uh, we, we were just told Jacob was alone. Who is this man? Jacob doesn't know, which is why the text just says, a man. He just shows up and he wrestles with him all night long. The story continues, again, from Jacob's perspective, and that's important because in the next verse, in verse 25, we're told this. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was, hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. See, it seemed to Jacob that the man was not winning. Uh, perhaps Jacob was the stronger of the two, he thought. Jacob thought he might even win and the man touched, simply touched his hip socket and put it out of joint. With a touch, this mystery man shows his true power and then the mystery man says, let me go for the day has broken. Why does he want to leave? Uh, Jacob in this moment doesn't know. And Jacob just says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. It's an odd thing to say unless Jacob is beginning to figure things out. The mystery man, or, or maybe he is more than a man, says, what is your name? Now, the point is not, I have no idea who you are, by the way. What, what is your name, after all? Uh, it, it's in part ceremonious. Jacob must name his name so it can be changed. And it is part confession. Jacob must name his name. Jacob, the deceiver, the trickster, the crooked one. He must confess who he was so he can become what he is not. What is your name? Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Jacob is given a new name, a name which describes not Jacob the schemer, but Jacob the, the striver. Jacob is the one who has struggled, who has fought, who has persevered. Even that night, he had struggled with God, but that was just symbolic for his struggling with God all of his life. And Jacob then asks what the stranger's name is. But he replies, why is it that you ask my name? As if to say, don't you know who I am? As Jesus would put it years later to one of his disciples, have I been with you so long, Philip, and you still don't know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And then God, for only at this point in the story, does Jacob really know who this is, that this is God in human form who has wrestled with him all night long. Then God blesses Jacob. Jacob calls the place Peniel, which means face of God. For he says, I have seen God face to face and yet lived. The sun rises and Jacob goes out limping. This was not a dream. God in human form wrestled with Jacob and wrenched his hip. And as far as we know, he limped for the rest of his days. What's going on here in this story? I think what's happening here is God is taking Jacob through a kind of replay of the past 20 years. He is showing him his striving, his weakness, and what it looks like to prevail. And notice the order of things. First, Jacob wrestles then God touches his hip. He breaks Jacob's self-reliance, self his, his power, so that then Jacob clings to God and him alone for blessing. And in this clinging to God in weakness, Jacob is blessed. And of course, throughout the, uh, Jacob's life, he is coming to understand who God is better and better as he did that night. Now, let me ask you, are, are, you, still, are you still the old Jacob? Are you still pursuing life's good things in your power and strength? Are you still seeking to take life by your abilities? Do you think your knowledge, your beauty, your humor, your brute strength, your academics and degrees, your practical manual labor, whatever it is, do you think these things are the secret to a good life? The book of, of Ecclesiastes would say, no, the, the race is not always to the swift nor the battle to the strong, but time and chance happen to them all. All the ability in the world, and you can't account for chance, you can't account for being in the right place at the right time or the wrong place at the wrong time. No blessing comes from God who oversees all things, who rules over all and orders all. That doesn't mean you don't plan and act. We've already said that. But stop clinging to your efforts, your abilities, your riches, your wisdom, and start clinging to God. How do we get there? How do we get to that point where we cling to him? This only happens as we wrestle. What does that look like? You know, uh, some, some might be quick to say, oh, Jacob's wrestling, that was prayer. Oh, well, yeah, sort of.
But it's just as true to say that prayer was the result of wrestling with God. While Jacob's wrestling was literal, it's it's a metaphor for his whole life up to that point. Uh, For you and I, it's an honest struggling with God's purposes and providence in our lives. It's the, the process by which we wrestle with the discrepancy between our will for our lives and God's. Many people never, never wrestle because they either don't admit what they want and the discrepancy with God's purposes, they're just not honest, or they just don't cling to God, right? They simply walk away. To wrestle is to, to hold on against. Uh, to, to walk away is easy. To go along is easy-ish. But for most of us to get to the place where we can honestly walk with, we first have to wrestle We have to be broken of our self-will and our self-reliance and come to a place where we simply cling to God for his blessing in our weakness. Rest in God's promises. Cling to God in weakness. Uh, Those are not necessarily different points, by the way. They're really one and the same from two different angles. The third, step out as a servant. I actually think this is where the story gets interesting. Jacob steps out, limping, And he lifts up his eyes and he sees Esau coming and 400 men with him. He divides his children, his wives, his servants, and he he himself goes first. The phrase, by the way, is before their face. Jacob, or I guess I should say at this point, Israel is confident. He has prayed. He has planned. He has been named by God. And so he steps out confident. He doesn't run and hide. He doesn't shrink back. He doesn't send others first to save his own skin. He himself went on before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Why is he bowing? Jacob, who bartered for the birthright, who stole the blessing, who lived his whole life under the promise that the older will serve the younger, has learned that to be first, one must be last, that to be served, one must first serve. And he learned that to be sure while serving Laban, but there he had little choice. Now he comes to Esau willingly. You know, Isaac had said, may your brothers bow down to you, but here Jacob bows down to his brother. Isaac had said, the older will serve the younger. God had said, the older will serve the younger, but here Jacob calls himself Esau's servant and Esau his Lord for a total of seven times. Jacob has learned, Israel has learned that one must serve in weakness rather than reign in power. And through the rest of the chapter, Jacob will call Esau Lord and himself Esau's servant. He becomes a servant. But notice how Esau responds. Verse 4, Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Esau fully receives his brother not as a servant, but as his brother. In chapter 33, verse 9, after Jacob offers his gift to Esau, Esau says, I have enough, my brother. And you have to hear the overtone here of the story of the prodigal son. Or perhaps you have to hear this story in that. See, in the story of the prodigal, the son goes off into a far country, wastes his father's inheritance, hires himself out to a citizen of that country. And when he comes back, he is humbled. And he comes not asking for his rights as a son, but offering to be a servant. But while he's still a long way off, his father sees him, feels compassion, runs, embraces him, kisses him, and receives him back, not as a servant, but as a son. What does Jacob say of Esau's response? I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God, and you have accepted me. Why would Jacob say such a thing? Esau's gracious acceptance was a picture of God's gracious acceptance. Jacob had come to understand the undeserved grace of God, and he saw that reflected in his brother's undeserved acceptance. This was both evidence of God's grace to Jacob, because it was an answer to prayer, and a picture of God's grace to Jacob. The smiling face of someone who has the right to be your enemy, but comes as your friend, it is a reflection of the smiling face of God. And it's this smiling face of God, and this alone, that, of course, allows us to step out as servants. You know, we spend much of our lives striving to earn, to gain, to secure. We, we want to get good things for ourselves. Uh, most of all, we want to prove ourselves, to, to, to prove we have a right to be here, to earn our place in the world, uh, to, in, in theological language, justify ourselves. But Christ, great Jacob's greater son, or great, 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 
great and so on, grandson, he left his father and came into this far country, taking his father at his word, resting in God's promises for the joy set before him. He clung to God in weakness and became a servant. He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He came in weakness. He wrestled with God in prayer in the garden in a holy way. If possible, he says, not my will, but yours be done. He came in weakness, and he died in weakness. And the Father kept his promises and raised Jesus from the dead and restored him to the land and restored him to his right hand at the throne of God in heaven. The one who served became the king, and all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. Jesus now promises for all who believe in him that where he is, we also will be. That if we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Our sins will be forgiven. We will receive the gift of the Spirit and have the hope of resurrection on the last day. Like Jacob, we have the promise of God's presence and the promise of restoration to the land, the heavenly promised land, the new creation on the last day. And this is ours not by schemes and manipulation, not because we earn it, not because we prove we have a right to it, not because we pull one over on the other guy. It is ours because we cling to Christ in our weakness. And it is this, the promises of God that are ours in Christ, in weakness, that enable us then to step out as a servant, to seek to serve rather than being served. See, grace enables service. If you, if you know God is for you, if you have seen his smile, if you know he blesses us in our weakness, then you are free to serve rather than being served. We have the smile, God's smile in Jesus Jesus looked fully into the face of God's wrath and died so that we can now look on his smiling face and live. Rest in God's promises in Christ. Cling to Christ in your weakness and step out to serve as you have been served in Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that your power is made perfect in our weakness. We pray that you would help us to see Jesus in all of his resurrection glory and to cling to him. To cling to him and find our blessing and wholeness and happiness in him. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.